Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi as-samir alayhi minash shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Wa la udwan illa ala al-zalimeen Wa la'aqibatu al-muttaqeen Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen I don't want to um, shoot the mood down Because you know I was afraid that because of the way that the talk was going uh, it was, mashallah, a very upbeat talk, and alhamdulillah, rabbi, I mean, very inspiring at the same time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve uh, Hafidh Wissam, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue, inshallah ta'ala, to guide him to the straight path and to make him amongst those who call to guidance and they themselves are guided. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to continue to benefit from our uh, scholars and our speakers and our instructors. Allahumma ameen. So whenever I saw it so upbeat, I was like, man, I'm going to come and depress everybody because I've got a serious topic. I don't have a funny topic. I don't have any kind of topic that I can throw in a joke here or there. But alhamdulillah, you ended on a serious note. Alhamdulillah. So I can continue from there. Uh, I'll try not to depress everyone. But, um, and I'll try to keep the topic as optimistic as possible because the, the topic last night was optimism is from the sunnah, right? So the main thing that I want to address first and foremost, because I, I just came to know that actually Imam Abdul Malik uh, touched on haya yesterday and he asked the people, uh, what is your definition of haya? And subhanAllah, I just want to mention a statement from Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala to start off this lecture. Because Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he had a very, very different definition to haya. Whenever he was asked what haya is, he said, man la yahimmahu al-halal wal haram. Whoever doesn't care about halal and haram. And some people might think, well, what's so profound about that? Because if you're speaking about haya, if you lack haya, if you lack modesty, if you lack shyness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not going to care what shaykh gave the conservative fatwa and what shaykh gave the one with the strongest dalil. And you're not going to care about any of that. Whenever you come and keep asking questions and saying, is this type of makeup haram? And can I email this sister without getting in trouble here? Do I have to put a CC there? Or can I drop in a few smiley faces? Is it haram to poke her? Is it haram to do this? Whenever you're asking those questions, that in and of itself is a sign that you lack haya. Because the questions themselves reflect an attitude. It reflects that deprivation. Because you're not really concerned at the end of the day about whether you're pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. You're trying to find a loophole. You're trying to find a loophole. And your attitude does not reflect that you are humbled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you are shy in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why a very profound hadith in Muslim that once Rasulullah Sallallahu passed by one of the Ansar and that Ansari was speaking to his brother and he was giving him a lecture on Haya I mean he was, he was on him about Haya and some of the Sahaba were looking at him and they were saying you know he's being too tough on him you know sometimes whenever someone is, is actually saying what they're supposed to be saying when someone is actually telling it how it is brother don't depress him brother don't put her down brother calm down you know don't be too extreme with the sunnah right now you know they don't need to hear about this stuff right now take it easy on them Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was the one who taught us the perfect method of da'wah Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said da'hu fa inna al-haya'a min al-iman leave him because haya is from Iman. Haya is from Iman. Modesty is from faith. And I want you to really think deep about that statement. If you don't have Haya, then you will lack faith. You cannot have complete faith without having complete Haya. Now, some, some of us, what does Haya also mean in the Arabic language, by the way? I'm from Louisiana. We answer questions too. <laughs> what does it mean? You can't answer. You're the, sh you're, the, you're the Arabic teacher. What does hayat mean? Anyone? Life. Other than modesty, hayat means life. But there is a difference between these two words. Haya, which is modesty, and haya, which means life. But they both have the same root. And if you don't have haya, you can't have haya. If you have no modesty, you have no life. Your iman will suffer death. And subhanAllah, think about this. If you are not shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are not modest, 
Whenever you are thinking about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you, if you don't feel that sense of shame and bashfulness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what's going to hold you back from doing those shameful acts that enter a person into hellfire? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that connection whenever he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن an adulterer does not commit adultery while he's a believer. At that moment, whenever he's committing zina, he's deprived of iman, he's deprived of belief. Because you cannot possibly do that thing while having belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you believe in Allah, you know Allah is watching you at that moment. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on. وَلَا يَسْرِقُ حِينَ يَسْرِقُ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ and he does not steal while he's stealing, and he is a believer at that moment. He's deprived of faith at that moment. And Imam al Qayyim, rahimahullah, gave the example, or actually it was Al Fudayl ibn Ayyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, that whenever a thief is entering into a house and he hears the doorknob rattle, you know, imagine someone robbing a house and he hears the doorknob rattle and he goes and he hides. He just committed shirk because Allah was watching him the entire time. But he wasn't ashamed of what he was doing or he did not become afraid until he heard the doorknob rattle because a human being was coming. So the very, very first thing that we have to understand is that haya first is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being shy is not just the way you dress. These are categories of haya. Being shy is not just the way you dress. It's not just the way you interact with the opposite gender. It's not just those things. The very first most critical ingredient is being shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing that my creator is watching me right now. Whether I'm in my room and it's dark, whether I'm in front of my laptop and no one's home, whether I'm, on, you know, I'm chatting with somebody and no one can see those chats except for me and that other person and the 20 other hackers on your computer that you don't, you don't feel shy from them. Okay, whether it's this or that, I'm being watched. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there watching me. So I have to feel that sense of shame and shyness from him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, it's narrated in Abu Dawood, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Istahyu min Allahi haqq al haya Be ashamed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Haqq al haya The way that shyness is due to him. Fallahu ahaqqu an yustahya minh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest right for a person to be ashamed from him. Think about the things that you would not do in front of your parents, but you do in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Think about the thing that you, things that you do with your friends, but you would never do in front, that you would never do in front of your friends, but you do them in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Allah has the greatest right upon you. That you should be shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should feel modesty. You should feel bashfulness. You don't just go doing every sin that you can find an excuse for and no one ever told you point blank that it's haram and you couldn't find a more liberal fatwa on it. You do things knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you so you feel shame because Allah has a greater right upon you that you should be shy from Him. And then the second aspect of haya is people. Now, some people will actually be arrogant and they'll, they'll actually do things that are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll actually do things that are shameful because they'll say, I don't want that person judging me. Who does that person think he is to judge me? So you go and you do things that are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot have a lack of hayat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then have hayat with people or vice versa. And whenever you experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever you come into interaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you naturally gain a sense of haya. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Salah, we salah. Your connection with Allah, your prayer, if you do it on time and you do it with khushu' who could possibly experience that we salah? that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then come out of his salah and do everything that he was doing before. You're not going to be on G-chat G -chat or Facebook chat and say, hey, hold on, I'm going to go pray maghrib, I'll be right back. Allah Akbar, alhamdulillah, no tajweed whatsoever, no nothing, you know, no khushu' whatsoever. So now I can, so I can run back to the computer. Hey, sorry, I was gone. I missed you, smiley face, heart. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's not going to happen. You have to be able to experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you can be shy from Him. 
So that's why, I mean, people always mock and they say, it's not all about salah, man. It's not all about prayer. It's not all about salah. But at the same time, as Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, حافظ على الصلاة فإنك إن ضيعتها فأنت لما سواها أضيع. Hold on to your salah because if you lose that, you lose everything else. That's your basis. That's your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to do half of the things that you do if you have an, a, even an atom's worth of shyness and bashfulness inside of you. Then there's the sense of shyness from people. And whenever I go to shyness with people, first and foremost, I want to divide those two. Because this is something that had a profound effect on me. The dead and the alive. Whenever people die, they don't walk in our houses, they don't sit with us, they don't come after 40 days and eat biryani or makhluba, they don't do any of that stuff. All that is garbage, that's true. But at the same time, it is from the aqid of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah that the people who are dead can see the actions of the living. They can see the deeds of the living. Once you lose a parent, once you lose someone that's very beloved to you, someone that used to humble, someone that you felt a great sense of shame from, Imagine now that when they are dead, they can see your deeds. And Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an a'milu amalan akhzi bihi inda abdullah ibn Rawaha. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. His friend, his companion, Abdullah ibn Rawaha was, had passed away. Abu Darda, the great scholar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from doing anything that would humiliate me in front of Abdullah ibn Rawaha. So when you think of your beautiful grandmother, your beautiful parents and those types of things, guess what? You're being exposed to them right now. They can see your actions. They can see your deeds. There's, so there is feeling a sense of shame. And the reason why I mention this, I know that it's uncommon. This has a profound effect. It had a profound effect on me. That's scary. If you love someone who passed away, that's scary. They can see what you're doing. They can see everything that you're doing, all of your deeds. And then the aspect of the living. And some of us might think, well, if I'm shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why should I be shy from people? There is no contradiction. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was once walking to Salat al-Fajr. Zayd ibn Thabit, one of the greatest scholars this ummah has ever seen. And as he's walking, he was coming late to Salat al-Fajr. And the people were already leaving the masjid. And he put his head down and his face was full of redness. He was so ashamed of himself. You know, most of us, Salat al-Fajr, yeah, whatever. If you can get a row or two for Fajr, that's great. His face was down and he was full of redness in his face. And he was saying, مَن لَمْ يَسْتْحِي مِنَ النَّاسِ لَمْ يَسْتْحِي مِنَ اللَّهِ Whoever is not ashamed from people is not ashamed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever you don't feel a sense of shyness, a sense of shame, whenever you don't feel like there's anything wrong with posting this picture or writing this status or doing this or saying, I was here, I was there, or sending this, what, whenever you don't feel that sense of shame, whenever you're at a university or at a college campus and your parents aren't watching you, no one is there, whenever you don't feel it from other people, you don't feel it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot be shy from Allah and not be shy from people. The only time that there is a contradiction whenever your haya from people means that you will be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever you're shy from your iman. Whenever you're shy of your belief. Otherwise, haya is comprehensive. And it cannot be distinguished. And at the same time, sometimes we come across this attitude which is the don't judge me attitude. Again, don't judge me attitude. Oh, I went to the masjid and that guy was looking at me funny. So next time I go to the masjid, you know what I'm going to wear? Not only am I going to wear a picture that, ha you know, a shirt that has a picture and I'm going to wear one and I'm going to put, you know, some kind, of, some kind of caption on it and there's a lot of captions. You go to Walmart and there's all these selections and stuff like that. Oh, he told me that my, my jeans are too tight. Next time I'm going to wear a pink shirt and I'm going to have a mohawk and I'm going to put my earring on. He said that he didn't like my bracelet. Don't judge me attitude. Oh, she said something's wrong with my hijab. Who does she think she is to say something about my hijab? Next time I go to the masjid, next time I go this, I'm going to wear a tighter shirt. And I'm going to match everything. I'm going to wear eyeshadow instead of just kuhul. I'm going to go all over the place. Because she can't judge me. She doesn't know my heart. You're only kidding yourself. That is deception of shaitan 100%. When shaitan can deceive you into thinking that by being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by having no shame in front of people, that somehow you're proving a point that your heart is actually with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Shaytan is the one who's whispering to you in your ear and saying, hey, don't worry about your hijab, don't worry about your interactions, don't worry about this. Who cares about the music that you listen to? Who cares about all that kind of stuff? You're still a good Muslim. Don't these people know what a good Muslim you are? Shaytan, the same one who's trying to lead you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you what a great Muslim you are. Who do, who do these people think they are to judge you? So that attitude also doesn't fly because haya is comprehensive. Finally, I want to come to two aspects of haya. Actually, one aspect that covers two. Because haya, again, reflects in your behavior, in your attitude. A woman once came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this hadith is in Muslim, and she says to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that sometimes I have seizures. Seizures. Think about that. And whenever she has seizures, she's, she's walking randomly in the marketplace, she's walking outside of her house, she collapses. And whenever she collapses, she says to Rasulullah I become unveiled. I become exposed. So she said to the Messenger وسلم, can you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal me? From, to heal me? So Rasulullah says, if you want, I can make dua for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely heal you. It's going to be okay. And He's not telling her that you're going to go to hellfire. You're just going to be normal. You'll have to live your life like anyone else. Obviously, she's a righteous woman. You'll do good deeds, bad deeds. And then at the end, you'll have your scale measured. Or, or you can be patient and you'll definitely have Jannah. She has two options. Either she can be cured and she can still have a pretty good shot at going to Jannah. Or she doesn't be cured, but she's definitely going to enter Jannah. So she says that she'll take the second one. But listen to what she says next. She says, but Ya Rasulullah, can you just make dua that whenever I do have my seizures, that I am not exposed? Whenever you have that disease and that disorder, who's going to be thinking about hijab? Who's going to be thinking about being unveiled? You don't care. No one's going to care about that. Now, there is a very important detail that we often neglect here. Whenever she says, atakashaf, it doesn't mean that the woman is wearing one garment and she falls and she's all of a sudden naked. Okay? Imagine the garments that they used to wear. What is she talking about? Maybe her arms, maybe her hair a little bit falls up, maybe a little bit of her leg. She's talking about the things that women expose voluntarily today. Voluntarily. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's not just a debate between the hands and the face or whether the fa It's not that anymore. It's, what about my arms? What if I wear short sleeve shirts? What if my hijab is just hanging off of the bow in the back? What if my legs are exposed? What if I've got my henna tattoo on my ankle showing? Think about all of that. It's the attitude. You're not really thinking about hijab. You're not really thinking about being bashful in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're just trying to find the loophole. And still everyone tries to feel good about themselves. And this is not in any way, shape, or form a put down on the sisters who don't wear hijab or who are struggling with hijab. Brothers, we don't even know what it's like for them. We don't even know what it's like. We don't have to go through half the things. You know what? It's a struggle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward our sisters whenever they do anything that's close to hijab. It's a struggle just to be put out like that. Imagine if we had to wear kufis everywhere. We wouldn't even be willing to do that. It's a struggle in and of itself. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward our sisters and preserve them and inshallah ta'ala make them stronger. It's not to put anyone down. This is just to show that once you have haya, no one can tell you that this is halal and this is haram. لا يهمه. No one can tell you these things. You don't care about that stuff. Your heart will be your dalil. Your heart will be your guide. And I end with one story because this is a contemporary example. This example blew me away because this is not from the Sahabiyat, this is not from the Tabi'at, this is not from 400, 500 years ago. Three years ago, or so, I don't remember how long France put the ban on hijab. I actually forgot the year that they actually did banning hijab in public schools. There is a young girl, 12 years old, and she's French. Okay, she's actually French, and she's a Muslim. And of course, now all of a sudden, they're prohibiting girls to go to school without their hijabs, or with their hijabs. And subhanAllah al-Azim, this girl does something, and some of you might have seen the story that I thought was absolutely iconic. I'm not getting into the fiqhi discussion of, or all those types of things, if she had to do this, or if she did it, uh, or if it still counts as hijab. She goes and she shaves her head. You know how hard that is? 
Think about that. Those of us who are out always to try to show off and show people that, you know, how good we look, brothers or sisters, because brothers dress and act like women today. It's true. All right. You stand in front of the mirror longer than girls do. All right. I'm not talking about that. But the fact that she's still a 12 year old girl, imagine the self esteem, the effect of self esteem, had the courage to shave her head, and then she would dress herself all the way up to her neck. Again, don't worry about the filthy discussions, the attitude. And go to school like that, and have everyone jump on her, and make fun of her, and go through all of the humiliation that she did. And you know what she says? This is a quote whenever she was interviewed. She said, if being beautiful in the eyes of the, crea if the Creator means being ugly in the eyes of creation, then it's worth it. If being beautiful in the eyes of the Creator means being ugly in the eyes of all creation, then it's worth it. If I can gain haya from Allah, be bashful and shy from Allah, I'll be shy from the people. I'll be bashful from the people. But it's comprehensive. وَالْحَيَاءَ مِنَ iman. Haya is from Iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the gift of al-haya and the akhlaq of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and not to... Uh, make us amongst those who buckle to all of the pressures of society and the buckle and the pressures of shaitan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us strong on our iman and to grant us al-istiqamah wal-haya. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah.